for a history you won't forget and an experience you'll always remember. Visit the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History with engaging educational programs, lectures, entertainment, and enlightening exhibits. You'll gain valuable insight and be motivated to inform others. The Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, located in the heart of Midtown Detroit. For more information or to schedule a tour, visit thewright.org. Hi. In our search for domestic violence triggers, we have Ms. Daisy Mars who will share her testimony. Hi, my name is Daisy Mars and I am founder of A Way Out Ministries Incorporated. The ministry was established back in September of 1999. I woke up one morning and God kind of laid that on my heart, A Way Out. And when I got up, I immediately put it in action. I called a girlfriend of mine who I call a sister. Her name is Kathy. And I made that phone call. I said, the Lord has laid something on my heart because I've been struggling with surviving domestic violence. What can I do? God, what can I do? What can I do to get past this? What can I do to even help myself before I help somebody else? So when he laid that vision on my heart, I got up and he also gave me the acronym for it, All Women and Youngsters of Unprovoked Tragedies. And when I say I immediately got into it, I hit the recorder, put a full page out. 
Um, and I started calling around. What can I do? Trying to find resources and stuff like that. So your journey? My journey began. I started working when I was 14. I started helping my mom with my siblings. Um, school. I remember school. School was, school was okay because I found that to be almost like a safe place. It became where you can go and you can have fun and you can meet people and you can um, kind of come outside of yourself and just kind of, you know, be that loving, fun person that you could, you know, with the people that you met. Even the teachers back then was really good. But I remember um, those school days. And even when I was um, um, in high, no, eighth grade. Eighth grade is when I met um, what became my abuser. Well, I didn't meet him, I saw him. But when I got to high school is when he pursued. He pursued and he pursued and, and I wasn't interested. Um, and, uh, but anyway, that, that high school thing, you know, we ended up, I was dating somebody else and we ended up getting together. And uh, when I was a senior in high school, or was it, no, I was a junior in high school, as I remember the first time that he hit me. That was the first time that he hit me. Yeah, it was, um, we was uh, leaving a party. We was leaving a party, and me and my friend at the time, we was leaving, a, we was at this house party. So they had those house parties back in then. We was having a good time, and he showed up, and he got mad because we were there. And that's when, you know, we went outside, and he, he, he got and hit me because he was upset about that. Um, as time went on, you know, um, in high school, in high school, that um, he kept, he was the kind of person who, when I look, at, when I look back, you know, and I can think of it now that I saw a lot of triggers, a lot of triggers. When I got out of high school, I was still with him. We ended up um, getting married. We had two kids, I lost one. Um, the, um, the abuse continued. It got worse after the marriage. It's like we had, um, uh, Lord, um, it, it got worse when we got married. He got on drugs, drinking. Um, it's like the, my house, it became a prison. Um, it was a prison. I would get beat in the house. I would get mentally abused in the house. And my daughter, um, she would see it all. She would see it all. I remember one time going to a party. And when I came back, because he wasn't home, when I came back home, and again, because I was out to the party, before I even got out of the car, I got beat. He was, he was beating me. He was beating me um, for going out to the party. Um, and uh, my daughter would be, you know, she was, she was three, four years old and um, observing all that, uh, observing it all. I remember the stealing the money out of my purse. I remember the getting, you know, him getting a job and he'd lose his job because, and I became the sole provider of the house. Um, the sole provider, period. Um, but the money being taken and the drugs coming in my house and the people coming in my house um, and all the drinking and stuff. But the, if I disagreed with something, I remember getting hit in the eye and having a black eye. Um, I remember the threat, you know, as the abuse continued of him. He was with his brother one day and he was like, I'm going to shoot her one day. I'm going to give me a gun and I'm going to shoot her. You know, and, and basically a lot of those times he would, he would say stuff like that when he was drinking or something like that. You know what I mean? Then you, you got the I'm sorry and forgive me, you know, I didn't mean it. But then a few days later, you know, we're fighting again, you know. Um, I remember, no, I remember a particular situation because I used to be so afraid to file for divorce or to leave because I had a friend who I went to high school with. 
who lived around the corner from me who had gotten arrested for domestic violence. And her and her child was in her kitchen. And they had let him out. They had let him out after they arrested him and stuff, and he broke through the back door and he shot her in the head. That petrified me, because I didn't, you know, I, I think the TV um, scare a lot of victims that's going through domestic violence. You know, they don't realize that's what they're doing, but that is actually what they're doing. And when I filed for a legal separation instead of divorce, because I'm like, okay, maybe if I just do this, I'll be just a little bit more safe than filing for a divorce. And I got my attorney and I filed and, um, and did the legal separation and all the legal documents and for him to leave the house and stuff like that. And I remember being asleep. And I was sleeping, I was sleeping on my stomach. And somebody was straddling my back. And when I woke up and kind of looked up, it was a knife that he had used. It was him, it was my ex who had, uh, not then my ex, but it was him that had just stabbed me in my back. And I was begging for my life. I was literally begging for my life. And then when he decided, okay, he's gonna stop. And he got up and he still had that knife and I was just pleading for my life. And please call the police or please call the ambulance or something because you know, um, because I was just bleeding. And um, the only way, only way I could get him to get some help, he called my mom and he told me that I had to tell them that I fell against um, at the end, it was a floor model TV that I fell against that and, you know, kind of hurt myself on that. Yeah, and I did just that. I did just that until um, when the ambulance showed up in the fire, the police, he'd already left by the time the police had got there. But even I was still afraid to say what actually happened. I was afraid. Once I got into the uh, ambulance, they said, okay, now what really happened? What really happened, and I was able to tell him I had just got stabbed in my back. But by that time, he was already gone. You know, the police went to search for him and stuff like that, but he was already gone. Yeah. How did you get out? How did I get out? It was a while. It was a while because it took a few more times. I remember going to. Um, court, back to court, it's time to go ahead and file for divorce. Um, and when I was in court, he showed up, he showed up. And I remember taking them to the back and saying, he stabbed me in my back. You know, I was able to tell them why he was there, but they didn't arrest him. They did not arrest him. They filed charges but they didn't arrest him. And when they filed charges, they only gave him four weekends. Four weekends for attempted murder. Yeah, four weekends. And um, even after that, once me and my daughter was uh, at home, he broke in again. This time, he was choking me. He was in my bedroom, my daughter was asleep, and he was choking me, and then, uh, uh, I remember just the banging, it was the loudest banging on the door, the loudest banging on the front door. And, uh, you know, and he stopped and he went to answer the door and it was the police. My daughter had got up, six years old, and ran downstairs and called 911. Yeah, she called 911. That was a new journey for us. That was a new journey. Um, What had happened was, I remember meeting my husband. I had met someone who um, was from another part of the world. That's what it appeared to me. You know, another part of the world. And um, kind of took me from a dark place to the light and it, it and I, I say that because you know being in the dark 
is 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 where I was. I that's all I knew, you know. When I'm out in the public, I'm a whole different person. You would not know that I was being abused. You know, and I and I hate that I did not get my child help. I didn't know. When I was in the courts, nobody in the courts suggested that I gave me resources. Um uh told me that I should get my daughter help, counseling, even myself. They, no one, no one um, shared that information with me. Um, it was just like a typical court date for them, you know. Um, and that being by him only getting to four weekends, you know what I mean? They didn't take the situation serious. Um, but how did I get out is when I said, okay, it's time for me to switch jobs, get out of this house, and move. So about 11 years of terror. Yeah, it was. You think when you get away, you think life is good. Life was good when I got away, but that's when the panic attacks came. Mm. That's, yes, that's when uh, my body was so used to the fight and flight. That's what I was constantly in, that fight and flight situation because even though I had got away, it's like he could have just showed up at anywhere I was at. You know what I mean? Yeah. Anywhere. I even had my mom, you know, y'all cannot, uh, you know, I couldn't tell him where I was at first. When I first left, um, uh, or he'd show up there or whatever, but it was constantly in this um, fight and flight. And those panic attacks start taking over my life, but he still wouldn't stop searching. You know, you hear that he's searching for you, he's looking for you, he's searching for you, you know. And uh, by you still being in the city of Indianapolis, you like, he's going to find me. But then you still hear these stories on TV about somebody being found, they thought they was gone and they was killed. So this form I mean? of post-traumatic syndrome yes. not only affected your yes. work life, mm -hmm. Your, your relationship, yes. but your family. But my family. That post-traumatic syndrome is real. It's so real. And I remember starting a way out when the Lord gave me that vision. And I would go and I started having my programs. I remember the first program that I gave, it was for a young lady who was killed. You know, in her basement, her legs got cut off and she got set on fire. I remember giving that first program. And then another program, when I was, before I gave this particular program, I, um, this, this lady had, she lived right next door to her daughter. She lived in the house and her daughter lived in some apartments. And um, all of a sudden, you know, she's hearing shooting, so she's hearing shooting. That's how close she was with her daughter. But her daughter's boyfriend had shot through the glass of the door because she had got away from me. The daughter had actually got away from me, moved, was in this secure uh, apartment building that you had to have a lock and key, but he shot through the door. He shot. And he went up there and he, he shot her and her baby. Cause she grabbed the baby thinking that he wouldn't shoot. And I remember interviewing that mother and seeing that mother's pain and getting her help through the uh, attorney general's office because they could never, they couldn't get the guy. But she, you know, they, he didn't stay in jail, so to speak. Even though he, you know, he did everything he could to, I mean, he killed them, but he still didn't get the time that the mother wanted. Does that make sense? So, doing those times when I started the ministry, I had to stop because that PTSD was getting me I couldn't get past what had happened to me and my daughter in the house, you know, and it kept making me relive it. It kept making me relive it because it was a lot of dark times in that house. And um, then I had to stop and I had to regroup uh, for a way out. Um, I had to really get myself together mentally before I started it back up. Yeah. yeah. Now we have COVID, right? COVID is keeping everybody indoors. Yeah. 
COVID is generating potential frustrations. Mm -hmm. What are your views on the effects that COVID are having on potential triggers, Mm -hmm. domestic violence triggers? Women who are in homes are already kind of afraid to be there. So being stuck in the home, you can't get out of there. You know, you're you're right there. And the, the dominating person is always going to be right there and they're watching every move, you know. You ain't, you're not able to make the money and bring in the house, so that, that turns you know into arguments. And then if you do have money coming in the house, they're gonna take your money. Uh, you're in a situation to where you are constantly at his every command. He's watching you, you know. You go to the next room, you know, he's right there. You don't have a place to go because sometimes, you know, especially young, if you go into work, that was your happy time. That was your only way out, you know, of that situation at that moment. But if, you know, so many of them, I talked to a young lady who actually lost her job and she was needing somebody to talk to because she was, she couldn't leave. He would, you know, don't leave the house. He would leave, you won't leave the house. And she wouldn't leave the house, you know, so she want to talk about it. You know, just talk and, you know, is, is anything I can do? No, I'm just going to sit here. I just need somebody to talk to just right now. Take, you know, but COVID has probably raised domestic violence 70% because victims don't have a way to go. They're always being monitored. They've taken their money. They've taken their stimulus checks uh, from them when it comes in the house. Um, and they're still telling them what to do and what they can't do, even going into the next room. You know, so COVID has really put women and possibly some men who are going through domestic violence in a more serious situation because they have nowhere to go. They're stuck right in that situation. And then they, you know, if you haven't thought ahead of, ahead of time when you know you've been going through this abusive relationship, especially if somebody who's saying before COVID hit, this is my time to leave. And then all of a sudden COVID hits and you stuck, you stuck right there in being victimized in your home at that particular time. So you get a lot of um, the domestic violence calls have increased, you know, but they still won't leave. They're still afraid. They've increased um, wanting advice, you know, but they won't leave. You know, he's taking my money but they won't leave, you know. He's, he's beating me, but they won't leave, you know. He's beating me all day long, but they won't leave. So COVID has had victims of domestic violence sheltered in their own home with their abuser, and they have total control. What are some of the resources to help individuals? Some of the resources we got in, in Marion County, we have, um, Uh, resources through um, like the Julian Center. The Julian Center houses women with domestic violence, but that person who wants to leave that seventh time, we offer, like my ministry, offers resources to get you out of there. It's like one time I remember a young lady called me and she said, I'm ready to leave town. Resources, let me just find your resources for when you leave town. You know, we do that as well. Wherever you're going, we can find that resource. We can do the 1-800 national hotline, you know, but that person who decides to leave that seventh time needs to, after you got that safety plan, make sure that you call somebody, you have to, somebody to let them know, I'm going to make this step. I'm going to make this plan so the resources can be available to you when you leave. Like, you know, even if you need to go to a hotel for a week until you establish another place to go, or even if we need to get you into the junior center or, or something like that, but let us give you the resources, even to get an attorney for you. If you were in a situation where you got um, kids and you want to uh, file for divorce, let, those resources are available now. Those resources, we even got police officers now that's working inside of some some of the uh, uh, centers now that did not used to be there. Yeah, that did not used to be there. So those resources are available. Um, and then the Coalition of Domestic Violence has tons of resources. Um, if you reach out to, like I said, to me a way out, you know, I can provide those resources to help you make that next step of getting away. 
you know, um, but when you do it, you got to make sure you're serious. After that seventh time, you're like, I'm finally going to do it, I'm going to do it. Yeah. So those resources are very, very important. Talk about your book. Oh, my book. Hear Our Voices. Um, Hear Our Voices is a survivor's book. This is a good resource book. I was, you know, given the privilege of putting an insert in this book. And it was titled, Why Won't the Tears Go Away? And what that means is, even 20 years after leaving my abusive relationship, the tears still fall. You know, you still reflect back. And because the laws don't seem to protect the victims as much as they should, you know, they're still there. And even the batterers, you know, I remember meeting a batterer. He was at a program that I was at. And he was like, I'm no longer a batterer. I said, you're no longer a batterer, but your wife is still living with those scars. Or, you know, that person is still living with those scars. So even though that's good, we live with the scars. So this book is a really good uh, resource book that you can find on Amazon. Um, hear our voices. Yeah. Talk about your other ministries. Don't Forget My Name is an event that A Way Out Ministries give um, every year. And what we do is the community, we involve the community to where we present memorial plaques to victims that have lost their lives to domestic violence. And not only the domestic violence, it could be gun violence, it could be um, police brutality. Um, we want to honor them with the memorial plaque with their loved one's name on it saying, don't forget my name, so we can remember those who have lost their lives. Um, so we'll present a plaque, a memorial plaque to two or three family members um, every year in the month of October. What is it like to wake up to no more tears of domestic terror? Mm -hmm. You know, to be free is a God-given right. But to wake up every day, even to go, first of all, to go to sleep and know you can go to sleep peacefully. You know, you can just lay in your bed and know that I'm OK. I'm safe. I don't I'm, I don't have to be waking up out of my sleep being beaten uh, to wake up every day. And that's no today is a good day, you know, to be able to say I've survived something uh, that probably should have took my life. You know, because I live with the effects of the, the knife that was in my back to my spine. But to know that I can wake up to someone who loves me and who actually takes care of me. And even if I was by myself, to know that I can wake up and I'm free. You know, um, to, to be able to go out and help people. Um, to know that this could be you. You know, I could be you. I could, you, you, you know, people don't know that the doctor's been abused, the police officers who's been abused. People are just not uh, people that you see out on the street. They're me, they're you, you know, they're anybody. Anybody could be abused by domestic violence, from domestic violence. But to wake up and just know and take a deep breath and say, I'm okay, you know, I'm okay. I made it. You can too. But a way out ministries, we are, we've been here, or you know, we give events, um, we speak in engagement. That, you know, um, we have the resources for you, um, just to let you know there is a way out. God gives us a way out, and the first step starts with you. It starts with the individual person to say, "I am more than this situation. I am somebody, and I deserve better than what I'm living in." in this situation, yeah. There is a way out, and the way out starts with you. See, I uh, hear our voice on Amazon. Thank you.